from our top secret, highly secure headquarters, this is the Spurs Insider with Jeffrey McDonald, Nick Talbot, Tom Orsborn, I am Mike Finger, hosting a podcast about a team that has not won an NBA game since our last podcast, which might have been two weeks ago. At but least. who can keep track of time with these local cagers who have lost, what is the latest number? Uh, as of this morning, yes. what, what's, what is this today? Uh, it, Tuesday morning? Today's Tuesday morning. That would be 11 in a row. And 16 of 17? That's, that's, that's correct. They, they were 5 and 2 at one point. And now? Uh, 6 and 412. Okay. Two I to get, go to match the franchise record. You're excited four, about four that. Four losses in a row. Uh, which is um, 13 losses in a row. Yes. Nate, uh, said in which year, Tom? 88-89. Uh, Who was the star of the 88-89 team? Willie Anderson? Peter Goodmanson. Peter Goodmanson. <laughs> was it, uh, yeah. was uh, it uh, Cadillac Anderson? I was about to ask if Cadillac Willie. Anderson was on that team. He was he was one of the uh, more popular Spurs. Greg Cadillac. I, I, was, I was blanking on the for real first name. Greg, 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 Greg Cadillac, Cadillac Anderson. Anderson. Do you know how Greg... So we're going to get yeah. off on... Because um, he rode a bicycle. I was about to... Around the you're, UH you're ruining campus. my trivia questions. He rode a bicycle where? Uh, around the UH campus. Around the UH campus, Tom. We are we are hitting and where, all where's the, the where's viral UH? notes here. UH is in uh, Hawaii, the University of Hawaii. Gotcha. Um, right away, we're, we're, we're going viral with our analysis of the late 1980s Houston Cougars and San Antonio Spurs. Do you Spurs. think anyone that was around to watch Greg Cadillac Anderson at the Hemisphere Arena is now currently watching this podcast? Watching the podcast? Yes. Or listening to the podcast? Yes. I don't know if they've or are aware, aware of what a podcast is. YouTube, I think there's there's older people that that get onto YouTube and watch yeah, cat videos and stuff. Like they, videos. Might, they might have stumbled onto it doing a search for... I don't like know what do people search QAnon for. stuff. <laughs> My dad watches old car videos on YouTube. There you go. The, I uh, bet there are YouTube vid, uh, YouTube viewers watching this podcast who remember Hemisphere Arena that, that were around in 1988, so what, 89. What they do is Cadillac. they go on there and they, they Google Greg Cadillac Anderson and then our... Dumb faces pop up, Maybe. and then they click on it. Maybe. Pablo, be true. if my dad uh, goes in there and types in Cadillac, it, this thing might come up. <laughs> He'll be very yes. surprised. Uh, we we need to work on the SEO there when we search start, what, engine yes. optimization. Make sure Cadillac's in there somewhere. Yes. Your, your top players in 88, 89, Alvin Robertson. Uh -huh. Oh, that was my, my well, guy. Well, let's not talk Willie too much Anderson. about Alvin Robertson. Willie Anderson. Uh, Johnny Dawkins at the point. J.D. Greg Anderson, Cadillac. Uh -huh. And Frank Brikowski mm -hmm. and Vernon Maxwell. Were Mad any Max. Of, have any of those guys been? I know one of them isn't, but have any of them been honored as alumnus of the game so far this year? You guys of those? No, I don't think so. No, they came close with uh, Larry Kristovic, Kristoviak. Oh, I wasn't uh, there for that. Yeah, I missed that game. I guess. Yeah, you were. Yeah, the oldest, uh, the oldest spur I remember coming back was like Corey Alexander. So far, yeah. I was talking to a friend of the podcast, Raul Dominguez, at one of the games recently about alumni we'd like to see, and and he mentioned uh, he mentioned Brokowski. He'd like to see if uh, Brokowski come back. In there. Yeah, I'd love to see Cadillac. I'm not sure if Cadillac is still around. Um, Alvin Robertson probably will not, not be back. He's uh, had some troubles. Breaking breaking some some news here. We're going to see some Johnny Moore action coming up here in the next few days. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, that's nice. Johnny One Moore. of my memories of Frank Burkowski is I was uh, at a practice. I think it was in Denver and he comes running by. Practices are open then. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting at courtside and he comes running by and he reaches over and he hits my uh, radio shack. Uh, trash 80. Trash 80. Hits it like that. Uh -huh. Goes dead. <laughs> For, so, was, for, for our younger viewers and listeners, a Radio Shack Trash 80 was the uh, MacBook of its day. Top of the line, um, just the, 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 the epitome of new technology that, that Tom Warsborn used to use. And it had, what, two lines, of, two lines of text? I think it was four, four yeah. lines. Four Max, lines of text. Yeah. 
It, yeah. it was like a thing on the Flintstones where like a bird <laughs> pecked at the yeah. keys for and you or you, something. You had a what is it? What was it? A coupler that you that you couplers. Yes, that so you put the attached tel- to a thing we need called to even, a telephone. We need to even explain yeah. what a telephone is. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but there was a telephone with the yeah. with the corded telephone. Correct. Yeah, yeah. with the it has that the thing ear piece where, uh, and the mouthpiece, and you put yeah. it onto the trash eighty, and it would send your stories. It's Used like your it's the, like your camera now, except you could only talk to people on it. Exactly. Yeah. Used to be the first thing you'd look for in a press box, telephone. you got to uh-huh. have a telephone. Uh-huh. Yeah. Anyway, anyway did, uh, did Bukowski do that on purpose? Like he was being... Uh, he's uh, being he's joking, joking around. Friendly. Yeah, okay. yeah, but he didn't know the delicate nature of the oh. trash 80. And what uh, did you do? How, it, what kind of crisis did that cause for you that day? I think I had to dictate that game. Yeah. I've heard little viewers like and listeners what, can explain what dictating is. <laughs> you, you would have to, back when you had deadlines that reached into explain, the Explain deadlines. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> deadlines then reached into 1130-ish, maybe midnight. Uh-huh. Oh, I uh, thought you meant in the morning. Yeah. So you would you would call call the desk and at well, the what Express is desk? What desk is? <laughs> the copy desk. And at the Express uh, News, inevitably, it's if stuff. someone had to take dictation in the office— I was giving dictation. Mm-hmm. They would they would get John Hines, oh, our oh. wonderful colleague back then, and I bet he did it with a smile on his face. Yeah, yeah, it's very, very, very yeah. eager to take your dictation. You're exactly right. They would peel him off of him posting his high school scores. Explain to the people what high school yeah. scores, <laughs> and he would take the dictation. But John was great at giving and taking dictation. Just uh-huh. the best ever. Yeah. Did you have to like? Uh, you'd have to say like where where you wanted your commas. Yes. And your periods. Yeah. Period. Close quotes. Or let's say an next eight, graph. Next yeah. graph. Let's yeah. say an eight hundred word story. How long would you be on the phone dictating that? To With John, John? not not very long. Would He's you write great. these out by no. hand then, and then read them, or you just do it off he, off your head, off the top? Yeah, of your head? I usually did them. John could do it off the top of his head, and it'd be a damn good AP <laughs> style story. But there's no way I could. Yeah, it's a I'm life wasted. <laughs> yeah, it's a life wasted. Yeah, my uh, my no one cares. But my first byline in the Express News mm-hmm. was the uh, there's a little. Uh, town west of here called Dehennis, Texas. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Never heard of it. Where I was... Uh, uh, Never heard of it. I was stationed as like an 18, 19-year-old. And uh, there was a flood and nobody could get in or out. And uh, we had uh, some somebody here who knew me mm-hmm. and uh, uh, said, hey, this kid is going to college, making the mistake of his life, studying <laughs> journalism. He's actually there. If we're covering this flood, he can go talk to some people for you. Oh. So I called in. Uh, as a as a youngster and dictated a story to I don't even remember who it was, but that was my byline in the Express oh. News was. And you went and talked to like Aunt B and Ellie Mae, uh, Opie, and, and Opie and Jethro, uh, Floyd the barber. Yeah. Yep. Did the cement pond overflow that week or? Uh huh. Okay. Yep. Anyway, that was. And the, I had the, the honor of interviewing you as a high school. You were a high school <laughs> wow. baseball star. We're just going down memory lane today. <laughs> right. This is a, this is a heck of a podcast. <laughs> well, I when you lost sent, eleven games in a row, what else are yeah. we going to talk about here? <laughs> I was that sent, was before my first byline. I was still in high school at the time yeah. and uh, playing for a state championship, which we won. Mike said, "We're doing it for the fans. We're doing it for the fans." <laughs> yeah. Given cliches, even then, <laughs> Tom Orsborn, we can do the, the the people who are watching on video. Can see this. I know I, we're, I'm neglecting the the audio listeners on the old school podcast, but Tom <laughs> sat down when he covered baseball practice that day. Uh, he drove in, and I'd recognized him from the paper. He was the hockey guy. Remember, you had I was covering you, hockey. Then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You had the iguanas. Your, he would have his iguanas, iguanas, iguanas yeah. and the dragons. And the dragons. He would have his mugshot in the paper for his hockey columns. I was like, hey, we, we, we talked while we were on the. It's the same mugshot that's still in the paper. <laughs> <laughs> We were on the field the same for all of us. practicing that day, practicing our our, our infield, whatever. And I, and we the coach had said, you know, the Express News might be here. And we saw the guy. Oh, that's the hockey guy. And so uh, Tom talks to uh, Bert Herman, our shortstop, and I on either side of him in the dugout. And Tom had his notebook out. I would think it was one of those steno mm-hmm. notebooks. And he had he he what he did was he drew a line down the down the middle of the of the notebook and he had Herman at the top of one and he had finger at the top of the other. And then when we would answer his questions, he would, he would write Bert's answers below Herman and my answers below. It's genius. And I was just like, this is genius. What? <laughs> this, is, this guy is the greatest reporter of all time. And I told him that we were doing it for the fans, which was a complete lie. I was doing it for myself. Just say you were misquoted. But, but very early on in life, I learned you. that 
you're supposed to say things to sports reporters that you don't really mean. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, uh, what's this podcast about again? I don't know. We're doing it for the fans. <laughs> We're doing it, Dude, for, the doing fans. it for the fans. <laughs> um, <clears throat> So do you want to talk about the local cages or not? Well, I guess we should. We should probably, I mean, it says right there. It doesn't say the Hennis Insider. That's true. <laughs> so we, we might. <laughs> Glory <laughs> days, Insider. <laughs> High school. Is there, do you have anything rev- revelatory to say about the team that the listeners of this podcast might find insightful? Uh, I, I don't know. I like. Uh, Keldon Johnson's not exact. I mean, he's it, part of this losing streak, isn't he? Yeah, he's he's having a hard time. Like some of those uh, shooting performances are just terrific lately. Five of twenty, six of twenty-three, and he was so good in October. I, I just think everything. Yeah, I don't have anything relevatory. Like it's just this is sort of what you expect when you have a uh, not great roster to start with, and then you've got two two starters have been out. Jakob Pertl and two Jer- key bench Jeremy guys. Sohan and two key bench guys and uh, McDermott and Josh Richardson. So you start taking like four rotation players away from a team that was one of the worst in the league. And what you get is one that is worst in the history of the NBA so far in terms of net rating and mm-hmm. those sort of uh, metrics. We should point out there's nothing flukish about this. Six and eighteen, right? Start. I think when they have when, they're, 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 when they have all their guns, they're competitive, and the games are more fun to watch, and they still lose. But when you're playing like the guys that are playing 20, 25 minutes a game, you're going to end up getting smoked. Like there weren't a lot when they had all their guys. There weren't a lot of like down by thirty at half kind of things. That's yes and no. From the beginning, and, and this all started because of the first game of the season when they were blown out by Charlotte. But well, they've been well, they've been near last in the league in um, point differential for a long well, time. Well, the the pro, the thing is, what we're both saying is correct because they also just haven't had everybody together for much of that for reasons that are maybe on purpose and not on purpose. Right. Like I think the injuries right now are pretty legit. We saw them all happen. Mm-hmm. But there were sometimes in there. There were some games in there where all of a sudden Devin Vassell's out. He's a little. Mm-hmm. Or all of a sudden, this guy. So I, I think what we're both saying is correct. But the four or five games when they've had their entire roster, it's been all right to watch. Yeah. Um, and I think it's fair to say that, all, well, the, I'm, I'm not going to speak to um, the severity of injuries, but there is less of an urgency to bring guys exactly. back exactly. this season than there would exactly. be in a season when they're competing. Exactly. So you're going you're gonna to play it overly safe with all four of those guys you mentioned to not bring them back. And basically what we're saying is they're going to be probably shorthanded all year in some capacity in most games. So you're going to see a lot more of this going forward probably. Right. Um, What else? I guess you could run through the the two biggest injuries, Sohan and Pirtle. Is there any outlook there? No, I don't know. Okay. I mean, you kind of wish that if if you're a Spurs fan who wants, I think wants to be somewhat interested in the season, you'd like to see more Jeremy Sohan. I, I, I think I think the Spurs in general will probably be more likely to try to get him back on the floor. I mean, you want him to get as many minutes as possible, yeah. as long as he's healthy enough to do it. So I I think he's probably on tap at some point. They have they've been off what they played on uh, Sunday. And they were off Monday and today. They'll practice on Wednesday. We'll see who's back at practice on Wednesday. The other three injured guys might be your top three trade, trade candidates. candidates. Yeah. So there's probably you probably like to see them take the floor at some point so that they can show what they have. Or people know the the, the Thad Young yeah. deal from the last year, the year before, where they held him out forever and they ended up getting yeah. a first round pick. For people, him. people know. People know. People know. You know, not to take pleasure in someone's misfortune, but it's been interesting to see how Keldon navigates this rough patch. Yeah, we can go back to that. He was a little defiant after uh, the Phoenix his, his, game. Like, okay, he was uh, just – he shot nearly 40% from three last year, and everybody's thinking, oh, he's become a 40% three-point shooter. And then he started October that way, like on fire. And then all of a sudden, it's just – that part of his game has just fallen apart. And it doesn't even look to me like he's shooting the ball the same as he was in October, like the mechanics. He's back to shooting that ball where if you're watching on TV, it goes off the screen and comes back down. That's how he was shooting his first couple of years when it wasn't working for him. And I, <laughs> I, I don't know if that's just a, a glitch or what. And I guess what they're trying to get him to do is not be 
so reliant on the three ball. Like he can't make or break his his yeah. um it's, his night. Like they did against Phoenix the other day. They made a concerted effort to get like post him up. Like get him and get him to do something in the paint just to see the ball go in the basket. And he had he had his best game in weeks, but that was a it's gone full circle with yeah, him. Because yeah. they there was a time when they wanted to pull yeah, him out yeah. and now they're he's back yeah. in. They're pulling I'm, him back in. <laughs> I mean the 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 ideal would be the happy medium, right? Like yeah. you could mix both both parts of it, and, and that's where it's going. I think it's also worth noting he just turned twenty three. Like yeah. this is still very much a work in progress, and we don't know how much that getting the contract uh, has affected him. I also mentally. thought what what Trey Jones told me was pretty mm-hmm. revelatory too. To use mm-hmm. your word, that you know some of it is a function of like the offense has just gone. Oh. Kaput, and a lot of that is guys being out. Yeah. The guy they were running the offense through was Jakob Pertl. He hasn't been around for a few games, so it's it's Keldon getting tougher shots, harder shots, kind of forcing things, pressing. Um, you know, they get late in shot clock situations. He's got to just try to make something happen, and it, it, he's not that kind of player. Sounds so, like somebody needs a session with Chip England. Well, they were just in Oklahoma City. Maybe they could have powwowed with yeah. the uh, the Thunder shooting coach. Maybe so. Speaking of the, th- I guess this is a transition to which teams in the league are in the same boat as your local Cavs. And the Thunder aren't one of them. The Thunder are not one of them at the moment. Um, and I like this season. Some people get sick of hearing about it, but it is the topic of the year. Is the Victor Wembanyama? I mean, it's the only thing stakes. keeping you going, right? Right. Um, so if you look at that competition, tankathon.com, you can check out the standings. I'm not, they're not a sponsor. I don't no. know why I'm t- – Why don't you – you should do our website if you're oh, going to give some dot yeah. yeah, we have the odds on there. The, we, the, the odds are on expressnews.com of whether or not they can get Victor Wembanyama. What else can you get off expressnews.com? Oh, you can get local coverage of, of everything going on in your city in South Texas. Uh, you can get – like we have food coverage. Our, our dining section is outstanding. Chuck uh, Smoke Shack? Chuck Smoke Shack, our old friend of the podcast, Chuck Blount. You've got um, – uh, uh, high school coverage from David Hinojosa, UT coverage from Nick Moyle. Uh, UTSA coverage, UTSA come coverage on, from man. Greg Luca. Texas A&M coverage from Brent Zwerneman, and just everything. Is there any way want. I could sign up for a lose letter? You could sign up for an Express News lose letter um, that covers all the Spurs stuff. Uh, everything you could possibly want for a low, low price. An award-winning columnist. An award-winning columnist, Carrie Clack. In Carrie Clack. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Gilbert yes. Garcia. Gilbert Garcia. <laughs> Elaine Ayala. Elaine Ayala. Nancy Johnson. Yes. Everyone doing great work at the Express News, except the host of this podcast. Um, what were we talking Oh, the, the, the fellow tankers. <laughs> yes. So I think things can change, but... Five teams right now are making up uh, – they're not making up ground. They're they're separating themselves from the field right now in terms of <laughs> the Wimbanyama sweepstakes. You have your local cagers. You have down the road the the opponent this week at the AT&T Center where I believe tickets are available. I don't think that game is sold out yet. I'll, I'll check on that and get back okay, to you. Okay. That, those, those are the Houston Rockets. Then you've got three Eastern Conference teams, your uh, uh, Detroit Pistons, your Orlando Magic, and your Hornets of Charlotte. Those five teams are sort of, like I said, separating from the field at, at, at the moment. And one thing that I find noteworthy about the other four besides your local cagers is they've been through this before. <laughs> and... Like, this is going to be kind of a bummer for people who expect the lottery to save everything. And it could because I think uh, Wimben Yama is a, a higher ceiling prospect than any of the guys that those that have gone recently. But the Houston Rockets have picked second and third overall in the past couple of years, I believe. The Detroit Pistons have picked first with Cade Cunningham and then got Ivy at three or four. Four, I think, right? Um the Charlotte Hornets got LaMelo Ball third a couple of years ago. Uh, the Orlando Magic just won the draft last year and have the odds-on favorite for Rookie of the Year and Paolo Bancaro. And they're all still kind of in the bottom. So where I'm going with this is it's great to win the lottery, but you it, it, it might take more than one. It might it, it takes time to build even when you get that stroke of luck. 
And again, this is kind of a, a downer, but anybody want to jump on that with with thoughts about what I'm I mean, explaining it may there? It may take three or four years. I mean, you look at the Rockets, they're, they're on what, this is going to be their third top five pick. Yeah. Uh, um, the Magic, I think, picked seventh once in that thing to get, to get Wagner, right? Yeah. Yep. And then you look at and, the— And Wagner worked out for them. Yeah. Like the, and, these yeah, aren't, good these aren't pick, failed yeah. picks. Yeah. And they and they have Suggs too, right? So, yes. so that's— uh, I haven't been watching the Magic closely to see how all these guys have been doing, but I think that Wagner and Bancaro have been Yeah, Bancaro has yeah. been very yeah. good. Yeah. Suggs was kind of a— Well, I, f- I think it's just if you look at the history of the NBA draft, the number one pick has rarely been just an automatic— Right. I don't want to say difference maker, but automatic, like, turns you into an automatic title contender. Right. There's a very short list of those people. Right. And Wimby might be that, or at least he might he might be the guy that you just add him to any roster and you're automatically contending for playoffs. Mm-hmm. I think that's a fair thing to say. Um, I guess reasons to be hopeful for the Spurs in this situation. First of all, you know, you win you win the ter- the top pick. Wimby Nyama's the type that's going to be the centerpiece of something for a while. And even if he doesn't turn you around next year— you feel like that's something to build around. Also, there's still a lot of uh, cap space on this mm-hmm. team. So mm-hmm. maybe the Spurs, who right now are not a free agent destination because people don't want to come to a small park market team, and especially a small market team that's losing, well, all of a sudden you have a player like Wimbanyama to play with. That makes you more attractive. You have the cap space to do it, blah, blah, blah. You also have, even though we've been talking about Keldon Johnson's struggles, you have guys in Keldon Johnson, Devin Vassell, I mean, who look like they can be third and fourth pieces. As much as we've team. talked about Keldon Johnson's struggles, Devin Vassell's been great. Right. Like he's been exactly what you want to see from him this, this season. Right. So that, those are reasons to think it could work. And um, I think we were looking this up earlier today before the podcast. Don't tell them we do research. Well, they're going to start to expect that every week. Very little research. But um, <laughs> teams, teams that win the lottery generally don't make the playoffs the next year. There's usually some kind of Extenu- asterisk, extenuating circumstance. Extenuating circumstance. One of the last to do it was the Cleveland Cavaliers, won the, the Andrew Wiggins lottery. And like Wiggins wasn't even a reason they went to the playoffs the next year because that's the, the year they re signed. LeBron and they already had Kyrie and they already had Kyrie. Um, but it doesn't. That was that was 2014. Yeah, Gen, like the past few lotteries. I think Phoenix needed a few years after they won eight, and um, uh, it doesn't happen often. The 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 Spurs. We go all the way back to the Tim Duncan lottery, and the Spurs would have made the playoffs regard. Like Tim Duncan was outstanding. Yeah, but they are. You already had. You know, David, David coming Robinson, back, Sean, Sean Elliott, Elliott coming back, yeah. like that. The team that won that lottery was was uh, like a sixty win team the year before. They right. just were injury riddled. So, uh, um, I guess if if there is a point here, it's that the eat, we're going to do this again next year. Winning the lottery won't be Yay. a cure all. It'll be a big piece. Yeah, but um, and then, and then also there's just the the watching these teams the rest of the year. Like every win. Houston, as we're taping this on Tuesday, Houston went to double overtime, I think, last mm-hmm. night to beat the Sixers. Yeah, what, was, are they, what are they doing? That could be a huge, uh, huge well, result down the line. Spurs were up 20 at OKC. You thought they were going to lose the lose the uh, losing streak there. Uh-huh. And, yeah, and OKC was shorthanded and too, weren't yeah, they? Yeah, and, uh, SGA did not play in that game. Yeah. And it was quite a uh, fall-from-ahead defeat for your Spurs. Yeah. It was a costly win for the, for those Thunder, though. We, we talked earlier in an earlier podcast about how um, we might not really see the tanking go full bore in the league until the second half of the season. But these games now matter. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, I think now the Spurs are at a 25% rate. They've mm-hmm. won an even quarter of their games. Like that might, they might need to do worse than that <laughs> over the course of a season to stay down there. And yes, the lottery odds are even. Pops like her, hold my Merlot. Oh, well, we can talk about Pop in a little bit and, and whether, where he's having his Merlot. But the lottery odds have been even. There's less of a, a reward for being terrible. Um, but still, you'd like to have the You need most, to be bottom three, right? You need to be bottom three. Bottom best three is can. 14%. And then all, there's there's the competition within that bottom three. And that and this doesn't matter for women, Yama. But let's say you're third. Um, you can... If if you finish with the third worst record, you can finish as low as seven because yeah. the top four spots are picked out of a lot yeah. of balls. Yeah. If you're if you finish with the worst record, the lowest you can go is five. So there is 
like a slight advantage to being first rather course, than second, yeah. second rather than third, third rather than fourth, etc. So uh, the games like against the Rockets are huge. They are. They're huge. It's kind of like back in the day when you, the Spurs are like angling for seating in the playoffs and playing the Rockets and playing and playing the Rockets. <laughs> yes. It's like those are huge because you win. You win that game. It's like a double whammy. You give Correct. them a loss and you take a win. And Correct. This way around, it's a double whammy. You give them a win and take a loss. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll see how that goes. Y'all want to talk about um, the head, the current head coach of the Spurs, based on the past couple of games, has been Brett Brown, who's familiar with what, processes. What, what I'm going to say is the uh, the pregame sessions with the coaches mm-hmm. have been the longest of the year. Like we can't get this guy out of the out of the room. Brett likes to talk. Yeah, he's great. He's, he's great. He's great. Yeah. I guess we can cover the bases and say that the pop thing is nothing serious, according to the team. According yeah, to the team. A minor medical procedure that's forced him to miss uh, two straight games. He's expected to return Thursday against Houston. Mm-hmm. And he was um, at the arena Friday um, to do the, the media yeah. session, and then somewhere between there and tip-off decided to pull the plug and rest up, heal up. Yep. And what Brett Brown said before uh, Sunday's game, what needs to be – heard loudest is that it was minor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a minor we don't, medical yeah. procedure. Well, we, we can accept that, but it's also like yeah. they've played 24 games and he's missed three. Yeah. At, yeah. Brett was asked um, recently about, I think it was that game, about uh, his thoughts on Greg Popovich coaching this really, really, really mm-hmm. poor in terms of results, team, uh, did he have anything t- interesting to say about that? Nobody's better suited for it, he said, based on his, his past, his present, his middle, his everything. You know, nobody's better better suited to uh, to uh, oversee this rebuilding we've, period. We've covered, it, we've covered it a lot, um, both on the podcast and print. Maybe. But it is, a fa- it is fascinating to watch, to think – I mean, has there ever been a coach that won five championships that is now just starting from scratch with a new, like there? It's it's it's, it's the it's just fascinating to watch this mm-hmm. guy that is used has been used to just rolling through the league and competing for championships every year and has won more games than anybody mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. NBA history. Like yeah. no one else, no one else in his shoes has signed up for this kind of job before. Yeah. I just thought that was. That was interesting. Uh, winning is an illusion, he said. That's and true. Maybe one of the reasons he's, you know, greatly suited for it is because he has Brett Brown by his side. Yeah. That's quite a tandem for a rebuilding uh, project. So for the uh, Jeff and Tom who are um, grinding it out, showing up every day, practice, shoot arounds, games that many of us. Th- can, uh, do do not necessarily – I will make an admission as the host of the Spurs Insider Podcast. I have not watched every minute of every Spurs game this year. I have I have taken a few quarters off. Um, but you guys, how, how – what, what, what are you looking for the next two weeks, the next month, the next year? Like what, the, what, what storylines are you following? What keeps you – engaged uh, it's, it's, in covering this team. I mean, it's it's the same old, same old. It's the whole purpose of this season on the floor is to identify those pieces that are going to be um, part of the future, part of the, the building blocks for the future, and how are they developing? What are they? What new skills are they adding? What habits are they forming? So it's a lot of it is just looking at Devin Vassell. A lot of it is looking at Keldon Johnson. Um, anybody else we'd call like the – like a, Lynchpin piece going forward? Uh, Lynchpins, yeah, but it's interesting to see what Malachi Branham and Blake yeah. Wesley can do. And, of course, Blake's been Sohan, out. Sohan is going to be a yeah. huge huge thing to watch going forward for sure. Yeah. And then it's who are they going to trade? Like what's the trade market look like as we near February with Jakob? And we, we, did, we, we got into that last week, didn't mm-hmm. we? Or two weeks ago about mm-hmm. Jakob and trade deadline. I don't know if you trade him or not, but you definitely have to kick the tires. This is an. I'm not leading this anywhere. It's an honest question. Uh, what is Romeo Langford? How would you classify? His I don't really. He, he's a, he's he a, doesn't a lottery pick at one point, right? Uh, no, mid, mid first, mid first round. rounder. I think it was right outside at 14. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't really classify him as like he's just part of the future. Yeah, um, but he's also a guy that doesn't hurt you if he's on your bench or something. Right, hurt. 
plays hurt all the time. No pun intended, but yeah, hurt is certainly but applies to him. He's good poor defender, kid just plays can't hard. Stay on the court. Yeah, I haven't really seen much from him offensively besides just little cuts and stuff. Like in this in this day and age, if you're going to play on the perimeter, you have to be able to shoot three pointers, and I haven't seen that from him. But he's he's a guy that if he's your tenth, eleventh, twelfth guy right now for cheap, I don't I don't mind him. And um, two months into the Trey Jones as a starting point guard experience, how would you I evaluate that? I think we all know what he is. Like he's if he's not the starting point guard on a team that's competing for the playoffs, he's he's doing the best he can, just being a um, facilitator. I th- I think he definitely could. Been, if he's your number two point guard, I think you're okay. He's I been think, better than expected and has shown leaps, but he's yeah. not your starting point I mean, guard on a playoff. I mean, just yeah. just due to size and lack yeah. of shooting. I mean, but he's he's tough. He hustles. I, I, he's like a perfect to me number two mm-hmm. point guard. Mm-hmm. Cool. Well, like like I, I think going forward, if you could just move him down a spot. I think that's where Charles Bassey's in the mix, I guess. Oh, gosh. People to look at. Yeah, sure. He had a strong start. I don't think we've mentioned the words Charles, ba- Charles Bassey on this podcast. I think we talked oh, about we, him when we, he first showed up. I guess so. He, um, he came right out of the gates going crazy. Well, like, like he uh, belonged, but I think he kind of hit his. his uh, they started game planning season. for him. Yeah. Brett Brown says he does things that make you go, wow, but there's just not enough consistency of those wows. And, like this, everybody else, he's 22. Yeah. It's a good year to play a Charles Bassey. Play a Charles Bassey. See you, what you have there. You get the you get the taps crowd in the gym. Mm-hmm. Sell some <laughs> tickets. <laughs> yeah. The the which we mentioned this earlier, but you said the John, taps crowd. <laughs> Johnny, <laughs> t- they're selling tickets. They're they're bringing in yeah. alumnus of the game most nights. Yeah. Let me ask you this, because you're in the crowd every night. One thing that annoyed me earlier this year is they would announce Tony Parker as the alumni of the game, and that is no, that they're is still incorrect. saying they're still saying alumni. That's they've got to get on I've, that. I've right. changed it to alumnus, like in print. Yeah, I'm not going to go along with it. Yeah. Alumni is plural, people. Yes, like if we're if we're going to be in the middle of this tankathon season, like we need to get our grammar at least straight. Like like if, they, if the Spurs aren't going to win the court, they need to get their alumni is Latin, right? Uh. I think whatever it is, you need to get your grammar correct. It's Tim Duncan was not the alumni of the game. He was the alumnus. It was a heck of an alumnus of a game, though, that day for that uh, game. Uh, people, most, people recognized him. Many of I mean, kind of. <laughs> many of the alumni, plural, of the game who come through do their little session with uh, Bill and Sean and Michelle uh, on the good, uh, good stuff on the TV crew. Uh, did did Tim Duncan no, do that? Tim walked in and walked out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what I thought. They, yeah. Uh, so he's probably the one. That, I also Tony lo- came by. And I also, did the, I also did love that, that he chose Iceman. Like, Iceman did. I also love that Tim chose three a three p.m. game on a Sunday yes. to do his. Yes, <laughs> he was home in time for the Bears kickoff. And was that <laughs> was that um, hyped or no. uh, announced no. at all? No. So that's kind of, that that's kind of baffling to me. And yeah. that you could get a few people in the seats if you announce that Tim it Duncan's going to be. It would almost be false advertising. Like you'd have to say. Do you want to see Tim Duncan come wave at you for 15 seconds? In like and walk a very off? stylish uh, uh, ensemble. He's yeah. dressed like a like a roadie for Judas Priest. <laughs> <laughs> it was a neat moment. <laughs> he, he used to yeah. dress like a lumberjack, uh-huh. and now he's a roadie for Judas. I'm going to get in trouble, aren't I? No, I, I think he would. He's he'd be cool with that. We all know. <laughs> well, Tim. I don't have to, I'm never going to talk to him again. Right. So. Um, no, I mean, we, we, he looked style. There was a, uh, I believe there was a tweet from GQ magazine uh, with, with the photo of, of Tim oh, Duncan. Oh, do you remember what the, the, the caption was for that? Well, the, it was kind of an erroneous or yeah. misleading tweet yes, from GQ our, magazine. Yes, uh, our friend of the bot- podcast, Don Harris, called this out. He yes. tweeted directly at GQ. Yes. yes. Tim has not left San Antonio. <laughs> GQ still said, lives here. GQ said Tim Duncan returns, returns to, to San Antonio. San Antonio. I don't think Tim has left. He's over there at the Blackjack uh, Auto Shop, uh, hanging out at the Spurs practice facility. Well, return to San Antonio is the alumni of the game. Of the alumni <laughs> of the game. <laughs> all let's erroneous. get that right. Let's let's. The pedantic insider. But uh, as, as we're winding down the pedantic insider, as Luis just mentioned, uh, what what can we what can we what do you have? Any, what are you saying, Tom? Spur, you know, in fairness, Spurs have done a great job, I think, celebrating the 50th. I think they have. The Ring of the Rowell docuseries and uh, 
Bill Schoening's podcast yeah. and those interviews with, uh, like you said, with Michelle and mm-hmm. Bill Land and Sean Elliott. It's we're, been good stuff. We're, good we're, stuff. We're it's little, all good stuff. Little, get, the, get your Latin right. We're a little more than a month out to the from the Alamo Dome game. Like, yeah. that'll be fun. Latin used to be mandatory uh, yeah. study in a lot of schools. Really? Mm-hmm. Way back when. They, they tried, but I was like, I'm never going to Latin America. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't need to know this. In the times of Radio Shack, Trash 80s, and telephones. Uh-huh. Yeah. Bring you, did, did you speak Latin? Like, you, you grew up speaking Latin in the home? Yeah. Is that back yeah, then? Yeah. I bet, I bet you went to some, uh, Part of the some mass. masses yeah. that had Latin. Oh, yeah. there you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Pre-Vatican uh, on, uh, two days. On Oblate, probably. That's right. Blessed Sacrament Parish School on Oblate. There you go. See, I know a little bit about Tom Warsborn. So you've well, interviewed each other now. Hmm? You've interviewed each other. We've been he inter- interviewed you, and then we, you and Tom Orsborn and I have been interviewing each other since 1995, yes. basically. Been probing. When he interviewed me as an 18 year old. Yeah, I've been fascinated by him ever since. <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, like uh, little does he know, I'm working on that unauthorized biography. It's sort of like this. it's it's sort of like Jane Goodall with the apes, like yeah. studying this <laughs> specimen. This is this podcast has been way too much about Mike Finger, but <laughs> I met. Tom, I agree. Tom Orsborn um, interviewed me in um, either the last week of May or the first week of June in 1995 because that's when we were about to go to state. I met another member of this podcast what, in sept- August or September of 1995. Who? That's, that's when I met wow. this jabroni. <laughs> that's 20 27 years it's insane it's like and a, you can just feel the chemistry <laughs> yes it's, it's like Lennon and McCartney <laughs> meeting in Liverpool yeah <laughs> except they made uh, timeless art we made this <laughs> but this is something <laughs> and as we, as we wind this down we all can't be Lennon McCarthy McCarthy, Lennon, Lennon and McCartney. We can't be Lennon and McCarthy. We can't be L- Lennon and McCarthy, meaning L E N I N and Joseph McCarthy. Oh, like I was thinking you were guys. talking about the Cowboys coach. Uh, we I was can't, like, I could totally be that guy. We can't. Uh, we can't be Mike McCarthy. Nachos. We can't be. We'll be Lennon and McCartney. We can't all be Orsborn and Talbot. We we can't necessarily. No one would want to be Finger and McDonald. But we can be what we we are. And I'm losing the thread again. But just be who you're going to be, and there's no telling. Whatever you make is something in the world that what didn't exist it. before. He's got it. Make it your own. Make it your own. Take pride in whatever you do, and take care of each other, and keep it real till next time. <laughs>